Welcome to DMX Unplugged. Uh, I'm Ned Kit Pride. I'm the ETC Marketing Product Manager for Power Controls, uh, which means I cover sensor racks, all of our Echo Relay Panel products, distribution, uh, and Color Source Relay, which is why I'm here. And with me is the estimable Erin Giblin. I am a field project coordinator for the Western United States. Uh, so I see a couple little Westies in here. So what up to my West Coast folks? Um, I have a background in being a stage manager and a light designer, and I also worked for a company called City Theatrical uh, that makes a wireless protocol called Show DMX that ETC has adopted into some of its equipment. So that's part of what makes me qualified to be standing in front of you here or sitting in front of your computer here today. So, yeah. Excellent. So we're going to talk today about wireless. And wireless technology has been used on stage for well over 20 years now. Uh, controlling things like stage automation and lighting uh, in The Lion King, uh, all the way down to individual effects uh, and entire shows. So um, it's a protocol, wireless technology in general though, is something that often makes us nervous that we might become this guy. Uh, you know, when you have a cell phone and you, and you drop coverage, it's frustrating. Uh, you may have to call someone back right away. You may get a little, you may have to ask them to repeat themselves once or twice. But generally speaking, it's more, it's, an, it's a nuisance and an annoyance. Losing wireless signal during a show is absolutely untenable. You can't have that. You cannot hit the go button and have nothing happen. And so it's understandable that there's been a lot of, that there's hesitation, that there's nervousness about adopting wireless technology uh, in uh, use during, you know, in shows, not just for setup. And so the purpose of this class is to help take some of those nerves away, to give a broad overview of wireless technology and wireless protocols. Uh, and then we're going to take a more specific look at the color source relay product and setting up a color source relay system. Um, but before we leave this guy, think back to, I had a call actually in this building earlier in the week. And I realized as I had to walk towards the giant window uh, to, so my wife didn't have to keep repeating herself, that it had been easily months since I'd had to do that anywhere. Uh, I never think about where I'm setting up my computer at home anymore. I remember I spent years waiting to be able to buy a house so I could put my wired whole house network in and as other projects have taken over, I've realized I don't need it anymore because my wireless router is doing just fine in any room in my house. So uh, there are a lot of reasons to be confident in wireless and particularly in using wireless DMX. And sometimes it's an absolute necessity. We're talking about retrofitting spaces. Uh, if any of you are working in you know, older spaces, um, venues that have been around for a long time, especially abroad, it is really hard to run DMX, new DMX lines through marble. Uh, and it is uh, very tricky to, you know, people don't want to put conduit on top of these beautiful spaces and this amazing, and, and mess up the, the architecture that has been there for, for decades, if not centuries. Um, so wireless DMX in particular, and wireless networking in general, are things that are, that are sometimes important just in getting the potential of your space, uh, making the potential of your space available to you uh, as you continue to develop your lighting system. Um, and sometimes, and you know, the, the cat is also out of the bag. You know, as designers, as entertainers, the fact that we know that we can make a lantern, a DMX controllable lantern that doesn't have a wire dragging across the stage as you, as you have your special night scene, you want to be able to do that and knowing how to do that in the way that's going to make it reliable and and being able to take advantage of technology as it develops is one of our goals here for the class today so what is wireless let's get into it a little more practically we're going to talk about it a little more in depth we're going to do a little bit of math don't worry it won't hurt i promise um when we talk about wireless we're talking about sending data from point a to point b that's really the long and short of it. 
Um, you know, sometimes there's a system uh, consisting of one transmitter to multiple receivers. Sometimes it's one to one. We'll kind of break those down a little bit, but it's really taking the place of cable in your system. Um, when we're talking about wireless today, we are going to focus specifically on the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. Uh, that's a spectrum that's pretty commonly used. It's an unlicensed band in the United States and North America. Um, it's also where Wi-Fi, cell phones, and Bluetooth operate. Um, so there's a lot of other things going on in there that we might have to navigate around. Uh, there is quite a bit of space out there in the spectrum, but even though it looks like there's a lot of spaces, there's only a couple that we're allowed to operate in. Um, even though there are a few, a lot of uh, questions that we get sometimes is why are we operating in this band? It's, it's so crowded, more and more people are there, more and more consumer technology is there. Why do we stay there? Why don't we go to some place that's quieter like 900 megahertz or five gigahertz? Well, the reason for that is twofold. As we go up in the spectrum, we lose our ability to pass through objects. So has anyone here tried to turn their home router from 2.4 up to five? Yeah, what happened? Exactly. It was great in the room that you were in, but maybe the room next door, the room a little further down the hall, you lose signal pretty quickly. So, but it was faster, right? Yeah. So you increase your ability to pass data, you increase your bandwidth, but you lose your ability to pass through objects. Now going the other direction down to 900, you know, you gain that range. You can go for miles but you don't get as good a bandwidth, you don't get the speed that you're used to. So 2.4 is really the place that we like to be. It's really the happy medium for us in terms of entertainment protocols. Um, let's break down 2.4 a little bit, because I've kind of said this thing, 2.4 gigahertz spectrum, but how do, how do we look at that? How do we think about it? Because it's wireless, so clearly I can't just show you. Uh, so here's a nice little image to break it down a little more. Um, in general, there's 14 channels that we talk about within the wireless spectrum. Um, those range, when we talk about low, we're talking about, say, one through six. When we talk about high, we're kind of up at the other end of the spectrum. And we'll break this down a little bit more, but this just kind of gives you a visual rep representation or an idea to put some of these concepts on as we move forward. Um, any questions on either what Ned or I have said so far? Great. So let's talk about best practices. And when I talk about these best practices, these are kind of general to be a good uh, wireless user, to be um, you know, happy with your wireless system, regardless of what that system is. I will kind of focus on the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum, again, because that's really where we're operating. But you could really apply these to anything, including your home router. Uh, so there's three major things that we're going to talk about. The first is going to be planning and communication. What and was that's that? Planning and communication. Right. And you're going to hear me say it many, many, many times. So I apologize, but it is the most important thing, and I'll get into why. The second is avoiding interference, and that's going to be both radio interference and physical interference. And the third is going to be um, talking about altruism and talking about how to be a good wireless user in the spectrum. So planning and communication. I apologize. You're going to get so tired of hearing me say it. But I think we, uh, who here comes from a theatrical background? Raise your hand. Everybody. We all come from a theatrical background. So we're all used to having you know, meetings before productions, sometimes months out, sometimes, I've had them a year out. You know, you're used to planning way ahead of time, you know, talking to sound, talking to costumes, making sure that everything's working together. And wireless is no different. A lot of people are kind of looking at this as, well, I'm just gonna go in and I'm gonna turn the power all the way up and you know, I'm gonna blow everybody else out of the water. Well, what do you think everyone else is gonna do when they get into a room? What, what do you think happens if 14 people go in a room and start screaming? Get loud, and noisy, can't hear a loud and noisy, can't hear a thing. Nobody's getting through. So the number one thing about being a wireless user and building a good wireless system is to plan and communicate your use and needs to the other wireless users in your system. Um, in general, you don't have to have a long conversation with people who are outside of your band. So in this case, 2.4, if someone's down in 900, if someone's up in five, you might just want to check in, make sure you know things aren't too close together, but for the most part, you don't really have to worry about them. But me, being, me, making sure that your plan is in place, other people know it, and that if you do have a problem, you know how to get in touch with those people. You know, maybe everything was working fine, and then you come in one day, it's not. 
That's when you talk to your other wireless users. Hey, did you change how you're operating? Hey, that affected me. How can we mitigate this so that we're both successful? So again, that's number one. The next thing that we're going to talk about is uh, avoiding interference. Again, both radio and physical. So as we talked about, 2.4 gigahertz spectrum, great for range, great for bandwidth, really not the best place for interference. Really kind of a bummer in terms of being able to get through for that. So there are a couple different ways that we avoid that. So the first way that we do is we break down this system of 14 numbers into some smaller pieces that we can operate in. Um, so I talked with the sound guys earlier today. I found out that my mic uh, is up near channel 10. So I kind of know, OK, sound's up here. Uh, we talked with the Wi-Fi, uh, the IT guys. They're in six. So we kind of have an idea of, OK, that's where other wireless users are. Maybe when I start to use my stuff, I'm going to stay in the low. I'm going to stay down here so I know that I'm away from other people. So by being able to break down our wireless signal into different parts of the spectrum allows people to kind of operate together happily. So that's kind of the first idea that we have. The second one, before I dig into it a little bit, I'm going to explain the, way, the two major ways that our wireless works. Um, so the first is going to be a spread spectrum. So and if anyone is a wireless power user out there, I realize that the way that we're describing it is a little oversimplistic. It kind of glosses over some things. But again, for basic understanding, for us to kind of be able to get up and running and use wireless well, this is kind of a good, a good process. So if you dig into it later and you're like, hey, that girl at Q didn't say that right, that's why. I'm just kind of doing a quick glossy overview for it. Um, so with this form of uh, broadcast, Essentially, what we do is we choose a channel to operate on. And under quiet uh, scenarios where there's not much interference, we're going to push all of our signal on that one channel. As we get more interference and as more things come into play, we're going to start spreading out. We're going to start spreading out that signal. So rather than just operating on, let's say, 3, if we think back to our 1 through 14 range, we're going to spread down into 2, we're going to spread down into 4, and that's going to allow us whatever is blowing us out in 3, it's going to allow us to um, get the signal through on those other channels. So that's one way, and that's typically um, Ethernet, those kind of things. Um, the other way, and this is how wireless DMX typically works, is with a method called frequency hopping. And what this is going to do is within a predetermined range of channels, our signal is going to hop between different channels of operation. So for instance, if I want to be in the low part of the spectrum, I'm going to have a predetermined pattern. And I'm going to hop from 2 down to 4, over to 6, back to 3, 5, 1, so on and so forth. So again, if I all of a sudden get a bunch of interference on a single channel, because I'm always hopping and because I'm always sending my signal, I'll be able to get through. So those are kind of the two major forms of operation that help us avoid interference. Uh, for frequency hopping, um, if you want to nerd out about this a little bit, it was invented by Hedy Lamarr, the screen actress. Um, you should read her story. It involves Nazis and spies and treason and being smuggled on a boat. It's a great story. It's really fun. It's a really great thing to nerd out on, especially on a Sunday. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about physical interference. Uh, so there are three major things that we look at when we talk about physical interference. The first is going to be reinforced glass. The second is going to be metal. And the last is going to be water. Any idea what those three have in common? They're all reflective. So reinforced, reinforced glass all, and, and water, they're all reflective. And at the end of the day, our signal is really just a sine wave. So those are the three things that can really easily cause physical um, interference, as well as blocking the signal. Um, and we have to remember, humans are 80% water. So that's another thing. If you're in a crowded room, if we think about how crowded the terrace was at lunchtime just now, if you're trying to send you know, your transmitter and the receiver at the same level across a group of people, that can, cause, that can cause you some trouble. So just something to keep in mind when you're setting things up. The other thing to think of is um, other transmitters, even if they're not in the same part of the spectrum. Keep those at least two feet apart. It'll just prevent any interference going on. That's kind of a rule of thumb. Um, don't put your transmitters in a network rack, because it is a giant metal box. <laughs> so the last thing that I'm going to talk about is wireless power. 
And no, I'm not talking about Tesla or those new fancy phone chargers that you get at Starbucks. Um, I'm talking about the actual power of the signal that we're sending out at any given time. Um, we're, we me measure this in dBi um, or decibels, um, similar to how we measure sound. Um, and as a general rule of thumb, we recommend that you put your show into show like conditions, talking to your other users, get everything up and running, and if everything's running really well, maybe turn your power down a little bit and still, still, see if it still runs well. And not only will that allow your other users to operate well, it also gives you somewhere to go if you do start having problems with interference. You can turn it up. The next thing we're gonna talk about is directional signal. So if you guys have seen our lovely wireless transmitters here on the table, they have a little two dBi omnidirectional antenna on the table. Uh, this has a horizontal plane. If you think of it like a donut of signal over the antenna, it has a nice horizontal spread, but not so much vertical. So for this room, the way that we've set up, we have a few receivers. We have one here on the stage. There's one behind Ned. There's um, two behind us on either side. This is a really great antenna for that because we kind of have them all over the place. They're all on the same plane. We can kind of hit everybody. But what if we're in a proscenium house? You know, what if we're at the Met? You know, and the um, booth is at the back of the stage. Everything we're trying to hit is up in the electrics or out on the stage. That's when we might consider something like a directional antenna. And that's going to put out a cone of signal rather than the donut. So if we think like a source bore. So it's going to have height and width at the same time. So that's a great way to get your signal out with a little more power. But it's also a great way to not cause interference to other people. Because if your sound folks or your clear comm are kind of out behind you, you've narrowed down your usage. So when we look at these antennas, you know, different um, degrees of antennas, they're actually putting out the same amount of power. We're just focusing them in a single direction rather than spreading them around. Any questions on that? Yes. When you were, sorry. That's okay. When you were talking about the channels. Uh-huh. So the channels can be broken down in a lot of different ways, and different manufacturers will do it different ways. So maybe. Okay. Um, it just depends on the system that you have. Um, when I pull it up again, let's come back to that, okay. and let's talk about how we break down channels a little bit. I'd say the 1 through 14 tends to be the most common way to do it, um, but sometimes like sound or um, actually our arc system that we'll talk about a little bit more in uh, just a minute, we'll break it down even further so there'll be like 22 channels within there. So sometimes it means that. Also sometimes, uh, for instance, our uh, color source relays have what's called a wireless ID and those have a numeric value as well. They don't necessarily refer to the channel but they do refer to what part of the spectrum is. So that's our planning and communication come in really handy because you can read the manual, you can double check with the manufacturer, make sure you know what part of the um, spectrum you're gonna be in. So, the cha so that channeling is not like an industry standard? Unfortunately, no. Yeah. So you had a question? Uh, you know, I was gonna ask about um, the capability of multiple antennas on the color source relay. So, sure. Uh, so obviously it comes with one antenna. Mm -hmm. So you can put multiple antennas on it, but the thing to remember is when you put two antennas on, it splits the power that's coming out of them. So let's say I have a directional antenna and it's a five dBi antenna and it typically goes 500 feet, just pulling a number out of the air. If I put a second directional antenna on, it'll likely the two of them will each only go 250 feet. So it's a great way to go around a corner. It's a great way to kind of you know, catch a section. Um, but in terms of trying to double your power, that's when you would go more for a bigger antenna or maybe a second transmitter rather than doing the two different antennas. So, great question. Anybody else? There's more opportunity later, so. Great, so let's dig a little bit more into the different wireless protocols. There are gonna be three major protocols that we talk about today. Uh, the first one is gonna be wireless ethernet. So it's gonna be like what's in your router and the example we're gonna use is uh, setting up a, a wireless router for your IRFR app, because that's kind of a common thing that we do in theater. Um, the second, we're gonna talk about the GDS uh, ARC system, which is a mesh network. 
Um, we'll dig into that a little bit. And then the last thing that we're going to look at is the color source relay. And we're going to deep dive a little bit into the wireless CMX since I think that's kind of what you guys are really here for. And it's probably what you're going to be struggling with the most out in the field. So wireless Ethernet, um, this again, most commonly in 2.4, we're seeing a lot more in 5. We're seeing moves to other, one, uh, other locations kind of as the um, FCC has been dictating different parts of the spectrum out. Um, but for our intents and purposes, 2.4, typically where we are. And when we think back to those channels, typically on 1, 6, and 11 are the places that they operate. Um, there are different topologies. So when I say topology, I mean how the um, network is structured. Has everyone here taken a network class while they've been at Q? Most people, yeah, I'm seeing a lot of head shake. So won't get too much into topologies, but typically a star topology is what we recommend. Um, and again, you can do it other ways, but um, it's a network that has to be configured. So you guys have been hearing about IP addresses, things like that. This is still going to be part of this. It takes a little bit of time, a little bit of setup. Um, it's a bi-directional signal, so you can go, you can send information out and receive signal back, which is great. And it's typically used for configuration. It's not used for show critical information. Um, anyone who's been sitting at home or even, you know, here at the Monona Terrace, trying to live stream something or trying to get your Netflix, if you pause for a minute and you don't know what happens to Jon Snow for about five minutes, you're going to be okay. You can avoid the spoilers online. If you're sitting in your theater, and you don't have a go queue fire for five minutes, that's a huge problem. So we really recommend this for configuration, setup, uh, troubleshooting, that kind of thing. So here's just a visualization of how we like to set things up here at ETC. Um, so you can see here the star topology, um, you know, typically coming from your EOS or your computer out to your wireless router, and that's going to be able to talk out to your IRFR. Um, any questions on wireless Ethernet? That was a quick and dirty. Run through? Okay. So mesh networks, specifically the ARC system. So again, this operates in 2.4, no surprise there. Uh, it's a mesh topology, so you have one receiver, and then your, uh, I'm sorry, you have one transmitter, but then your receivers can also transmit for you as well, and we'll dig into that a little bit more in just a second. Um, it's actually similar to a Zigbee protocol, if you guys have played with Zigbee before. Um, and we recommend it for permanent installation. Um, it does take a little bit of time to set up. Um, once the setup is done, it takes time to implement those changes. So when you have something like the ARC system is our house light system, they're really beautiful. If you haven't seen them, please head out to the ballroom, check them out in our product lab. Um, it's, it's really a set it and forget it. When you're putting those house lights up, you're not taking them down every show. You're gonna put them in there, they're gonna be there for a couple years, um, and they're just gonna kind of live that way. Um, they're paired by a predetermined pattern, so you don't really have to do a lot of um, setup in terms of configuration and addressing. Um, you can set them up uh, with your wireless ID, which does not, again, com comply to the 1 through 14 range that we looked at before. Um, but once you kind of pair them together, they're paired for life, they're good to go. Um, and it, again, it's not as fast as CMX, so we really look at it for architectural installations. Um, so your typical installation, we can see our DMX in and out that we're used to, hardline, coming from the bottom. Um, and then our wireless transmitter is going to be able to wirelessly communicate to our button stations. And then it's also going to be able to go the other way out to the fixtures uh, to kind of be the bridge between those two things. Um, here's a typical example of how we set up this topology. So I have two different uh, wireless transmitters here. And this is sending uh, noise out to uh, transmissions out to the fixtures but then I can have the fixtures transmit those out again. So a great example of where you might need to use that is actually this room that's kind of a nice, beautiful, curved room. If I have my transmitter directly at the back there and it's sending out that donative signal, these corners back in the side might be really hard to hit. So maybe the one that's on the end here, I can turn him on and he can go and transmit to the folks who are in the corner. So it's just a nice um, addition to be able to set your network up. Now, just because you can have things be transmitters doesn't necessarily mean that you should. Because if we remember back to our altruism statements, you know, we don't want to use too much power. So it's, a good, it's good to mitigate how many you have acting as transmitters. Again, put it in show light conditions, plan and communicate, check it out, make sure it works, go from there. Now, before I dig into wireless DMX, I want to talk a little bit about regular old DMX. And I know a whole bunch of you have already taken a bunch of networking classes. Raise your hand if you haven't been spoken to about DMX since you've been here. 
Okay, everybody has. So I'm not gonna dig too far into it. Sorry, people who are YouTubing in. Send me an email and I will do this part of the thing for you. Um, so the two things that I wanna pull out of that so I don't have to go way back over it again are to remember that DMX is sent in packets of information, so the 512 by 255, and that it has a very specific speed of 44 hertz. And the reason those two things are important is because when we talk about wireless DMX, we're talking about transmitting, and we're talking about constantly transmitting, but there's still pieces of signal that come out. You know, there's transmissions that happen. It's not one long flow. So when we think of the frequency hopping, where we're gonna have to break things down, we break down our timing by the speed of the DMX packet. So that means our transmissions are operating at 44 hertz, just like DMX is. So it's constantly sending, and it's constantly sending the entire DMX packet. Other wireless protocols um, operate a little bit faster than that. So they'll actually break the DMX packet up and reassemble it on the other side. So just keep that in mind if you're working with other wireless protocols. Um, they do operate a little bit differently. Um, typically, there's one transmitter to many receivers. You can have multiple uh, transmitters set up in a system, but they will each speak to different receivers. Does that make sense? We'll go over it physically in just a second. Um, each, receiver gets, each receiver gets the entire signal. They're not getting a part of a signal, so they're not addressed. It's not like receiver one gets this part of the universe, receiver two gets this other part of the universe. The transmitter sends the whole DMX packet, the receiver gets the whole thing, literally just like a cable, just like your regular old DMX cable. Um, it's paired by a predetermined signal pattern. It is bi-directional, so we use RDM. Um, it utilizes frequency hopping, and our wireless ID also tells us what part of the spectrum to be in. Um, so here's just a little visualization of that packet. But you guys are all DMX wizards now, so I don't really need to go into that. Any other questions before we get into more of the practical side of it? Great. All right, so Color Source Relay. Uh, Color Source Relay is a family of three products. Uh, one transmitter and receiver combination and a wired version. The transmitter uh, has uh, a power input, so it basically plugs into a wall wart uh, to power it up, and then it has a DMX input, and its DMX output is the antenna. So it is to be used with the, with the wireless receivers. Uh, if you look on the left side here, we'll go into a little bit more depth here, but there is a wireless ID uh, that you set and you make sure that your receivers match that ID. Um, the important thing to note though is that if you take these out of the box and set them up, they will work. You don't have to do, there is no configuration with these. You, uh, as part of our planning and communication process, you may select one of the other different IDs depending on who else is using wireless in your space but you do not have to do anything to get them to just work. If you have a bar out, if you're setting up a light bar out in the lobby because you're doing a little gorilla thing during the intermission or whatever, uh, great. You set the receiver on the bar, you set your transmitter by your console, and you just go. So um, one transmitter can support up to 32 receivers. Um, and uh, the receiver takes a power input, uh, plug it into a, you know, your, wherever your nearest Edison outlet is. Um, it is, has a built-in 16 amp relay, which means it can run about nine color source PARs, color source spots, uh, D60s, things like that. Maybe fewer if you're using a Series 2 fixture with it, but about nine fixtures is, uh, is kind of the limit on that. But again, you can have, you know, 32 of these in a system that are, that are all connected together, so it's a substantial number of fixtures. DMX and power control then can be daisy-chained out of the receiver to your fixture. So there's a, a hardwired DMX output. So the input in this case is the wireless, output is hardline, and then you just daisy-chain that to your fixtures. Power input at the top is then power output on the bottom, again, with your uh, power con connector, daisy chain that out to your fixtures as well. So um, the IDs you can see there on the top of the unit match on the, on, the, on the transmitter. There's 
there's nothing super complex about it at all. And then lastly, we have the wired version where you can just set a you know, DMX cable in, DMX cable out. And basically what this allows you to do is where you don't need wireless DMX, you can still introduce power control uh, to a system so that if you have, a, again, if you have, a, say, a black box where you want to be able to adjust where your lighting positions are and make an extremely flexible uh, system from show to show to show, and you want to be able to put your relay uh, circuits wherever you want them to be instead of having to hardwire a relay panel in. Um, this is a great way of doing that and allowing you to have a, a tremendous amount of flexibility in your space uh, from, from show to show. When you're setting up a color source relay system, you've got about 100 meters of range. Uh, so you want to make sure that if you're using wireless, uh, you want to make sure that you're considering that. Uh, if you have to, if you're trying to cover a wider area, certainly we have other antenna options uh, that you can contact your ETC sales folks about. We'll be happy to, to talk you through what those options specifically are for your application. And we're always happy to work with you to get the right, make sure that you're getting the right stuff um, for your specific jobs that you have or, or venues. Um, one thing, you can go ahead to the next one. So. You have your transmitter in a central spot, and then you have receivers then in sort of clusters. Where do you want your groups of fixtures to be? Again, where is it gonna be most convenient for you to get rid of that wire? Where is it gonna be most convenient for you to have space that you don't have to cross with a cable? Um, in this particular, one thing to note about this as well, is remember those donut shapes. You need to make, you know, we need to make sure that our donut shapes are crossing each other. And so in this particular instance, for example, it might be best, you know, you could conceivably have, if these are all high in the air, you may want to have your transmitter below angling so that your, so if the way that these antennas are, they're basically, their donuts are going to be vertical. And so then if you have your, your signal donut from your transmitter spreading out mostly horizontally, that's going to cross all three of those. So Learning to think in, in three dimensions uh, when we think about our wireless signal is something that's a, a skill that we're going to have to build. But it's really figuring out how do we get these, you know, how do we get the donuts to bump into each other so that, we're, so that our, our, our signals are matching up. Yeah, donut bumping is actually the name of our album. It's available that's in right. the lobby. <laughs> uh, but Ned brings up a really good point, is that not only are the transmitters pushing out signal, but the receivers have their own power they're reaching back out to gain the signal as well. So it's not just a donut of signal from your transmitter that you have to intersect with your receivers. You can have your receiver donut match your transmitter donut. So I see why you gave me a donut for my birthday. I get it. <laughs> All right, so when you're setting up a system, if you look over here, so we've got one through six options here. We're gonna get back to one in a minute, but Two, so we've, we've very helpfully matched. So if you'll see, you notice that, that these numbers are color coded and they match this scheme that's on this slide. So ID number two is covering channels one through 11. So that's giving your full spectrum coverage essentially uh, in the 2.4 gigahertz range. And what that's doing is if you have, if you're not competing with anyone, if you don't have to cooperate, if there isn't anyone else you know, to be, as, as I was saying, you know, you want to be more United Nations, less Jerry Springer, right? So if you don't have to worry about stepping on anyone else's toes, full is fine. Uh, it works great. We're actually, I th well, we were using that. I think we switched off of that. But yeah. um, if and when you have to start cooperating with other groups, either your ClearCom group or, uh, you know, you have a, a touring show that's coming in and they're bringing in their own uh, wireless DMX, you're gonna to have to, we're gonna to have to shift what part of the spectrum we're on. So three, four, and five are low, mid, and high groups of channels. Um, and then six is this very sort of separate section off to, on the high end of, of the spectrum. Now, when I was, when I was looking at this originally, and, and you may well have guessed and would be right that Aaron is really the subject matter expert here, and I'm mostly window dressing, but, uh, the, the, um, it, you know, one of the first questions I asked was, well, this is, looks a lot less busy 
up here at the top. Why would I not want to just default to going to the max channel whenever I'm in a situation where I'm sharing with other people? And the answer to that goes back to what Aaron was talking about with spread spectrum uh, broadcasting. And basically, when you go up into these uh, higher channels, you're, you're bounding off how far you can spread when there is interference. And so you start to inhibit how much room you have to maneuver uh, if there happens to be another party that's using that part of the spectrum as well. So again, for coordination purposes, if you've planned it and that's the, you're gonna be the only system there, it's great, but it's not necess there's a risk to defaulting to that that you might end up with interference that makes it a little bit trickier to work with. So going back then to channel one, okay? And what this is, is an adaptive frequency hopping uh, mode for the color source relay. And what that basically means is it does the same one through 11 as the full spectrum, but it's listening. It's paying attention to where it, it's hit, getting interference. And as it progresses over time, it starts to stop hopping to the places where it's noticing interference or it's noticing other things or broadcasting. Um, that's really great in that it's avoiding interference and that means you know potentially lost packets here and there uh, which again are getting rebroadcast again it's not like it drops out for these are you know 44 hertz is still 44 times a second it's sending that out so it's not as though these gaps are enormous but it's really making it an I you know giving you the most ideal coverage possible except when it starts getting really choppy and as we get closer to the bottom and as there is more competition for that space that's when you can start seeing lag that might be beyond undesirable to unacceptable. Um, in which case, but again, if you go in, going back in the morning, this is not something that it remembers. So, you know, you shut the show down for the night, you turn it back on in the morning, it's gonna start back again at the top here and go down. So again, for most cases where you don't have lots and lots of activity happening, um, maybe in your venues, if you, or, you know, you're in a high school in Topeka, Kansas, uh, there may not be a whole lot of just massive amounts of wireless activity happening. If you're in downtown Los Angeles or New York or at a you know, technology school where there's just constant amounts of, of wireless technology that are being used, um, that may not be such a good option for you because it'll just end up hitting interference so often. Great. Uh, so we're going to dig a little bit deeper into... You know, well, we just have these still images. Maybe, Ned, we should do a live reading. Should a live, live reading. reading? I love live readings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll do a live reading, All right, guys. I'll go get ready. Awesome. Great. So, Ned will go get ready, and we'll, we'll do a live reading for you. Um, so, here are some pre-done images. These are images um, that I, we've taken in the past of different venues. Um, so, here's a venue where really the only thing going on is just one, um, one uh, just Wi-Fi signal. I mean, there's some other activity, probably cell phones, that kind of thing. But for the most part, so this is the one over here, 14's up here, we can kind of see it's pretty quiet. Um, so this is the same kind of spectrum that we we're looking at. On the top, we have what's happening at the moment. And then down here, we have what's happening over time. So we can see someone set up their wireless router kind of around six. Um, and we can see the peak of signal, and then as it's been getting interference, it's spreading out to the sides here. Um, so if I was setting up something for a venue, there's some options there, there's some space. Now, this is a little bit more crowded, just a tad. So we've got a whole bunch of Wi-Fi going on in here, we've got stuff in the low end, we've got stuff in the high end. So when I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, hey, maybe up here is a great place to put something, relatively quiet down here, relatively quiet at the top. But if we think back to our planning communication, just because it looks quiet down here, doesn't mean that your clear comm isn't there. Doesn't mean that your sound isn't there. It might not just be, it might just not be that strong of a signal. So that's when it comes back again to planning and communication where really we need to know what else is going on. We need to make sure that, you know, we're not gonna step on anybody else's toes. So, so that's kind of the idea of that. Um, so let's do a live reading. You, you just about ready there, Ned? Ned, I didn't what? mean that kind of live reading. No, 
Are you serious? Yeah, I mean, I'm in I a wireless practice, reading. I, do you know how much I spend on the meditation classes? Are you kidding me? Uh, I thought we talked about this. May, may, may your last sugared Mountain Dew be replaced with a case of caffeine-free Diet Coke. <laughs> Nick Cap Pride, everybody. <laughs> Uh, so if you guys will bear with us for just a second, I'm going to switch over and we're going to do not a terrible joke um, and instead do an actual live reading of uh, the wireless going on in the space. Um, so if you give my computer one second to catch up, do we have any uh, questions before we get started? Yeah. yeah I'm still confused about what the relay does because it looks like it takes BMX in and then sends it right back out. Sure. So the relay, it, it, it is a 16 amp relay. So as you can see here, um, there is uh, a power in and a power out. So this allows you over using the DMX control to turn the power on and off to the fixture remotely. So you're able, to, so um, if you, on a very simple application, for example, if you just shut down the console after about five minutes or so, it will automatically power down. And basically that way you're not just keeping the lights on or keeping the electronics on and having that vampire load on all night when you're done using it. But it just allows you to introduce controlled power where you don't, maybe don't have it already. Uh, yeah. Two questions about the uh, adaptive frequency hopping. Uh-huh. Yes, it keeps trying. It, it essentially is constantly scanning all of the frequencies, and then it'll knock some out when they're when they're too noisy. So, but it's always scanning the frequencies to find the best places. So, if the interference goes away, it'll go back. It will, it will try it again. Okay. Yeah. And then um, my second quick question about that was because the context you were talking about the adaptive frequency hopping was with the uh, full spectrum wireless ID. Does it only do it on that, or will it do it on? So there's only uh, one wireless ID on the front of the device that you get to have that. So basically, so the, so the one, the green one, is the only one that does the frequency hopping, the adaptive frequency hopping, but it covers the same 1 through 11 as the full. Yeah. Right. So it's covering the same channel range, but one is doing it with the adaptive frequency hopping and one is not. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify that that's the only Yes. Yep. So there are six wireless IDs available to you on the front, and we have very handily um, selected those because they separate themselves out. So if you did have six different transmitters on one, two, three, four, five, six, they would live together. Whoops, sorry. Um, they would live happily together. Now, let's say you need more than one adaptive hopping universe. What you can do, and it takes, again, a little more planning and setup, um, is change the wireless ID on the front to the C, which stands for custom. And once you're in the custom, you have your choice of over 100 wireless IDs, including four that are adaptive hopping. So if you really want to do the adaptive hopping, that's definitely a choice. Again, we do recommend that you find something that's in a permanent space, because that's going to give you more stability over time. You can do it with your console, uh, but it's all, uh, you'll all get a jump drive um, that's in the shape of a lovely source for it in your bag. I, I put the manual on there that goes through that whole process, including screenshots. And then I also put on there, because this will probably be the other thing that you run into, and it'll be really difficult, I know it was for me the first couple times I did it, um, is how to set up your wireless IRFR. Um, there's a whole how-to in there for that, too. So um, without pulling up screenshots and stuff like that, um, it's done over RDM, so, yeah. Um, so I'm gonna take a couple more questions in a second, but I do wanna talk to you about what you're staring at at the screen behind you, um, behind me rather. Uh, so here we have in the room today, two different wireless transmitters set up with my color source console. And one of those is set on ID3, uh, which is going to be the low part of the spectrum. And the other one is set on ID6, which is gonna be up here in the high part of the spectrum. And so we can see this is a Y-SPY. Y this is a wireless reader. Um, we recommend it to all of our ETC techs and high-powered users. Um, it is very expensive, but it is worth every penny. There's a lot of free apps 
um, and I can recommend a couple to you guys if you um, want to download them that can do a quick and dirty version of this as well. It's a really nice way to see what else is going on if you're going into a venue and it's after hours and you can't talk to the IT department or if you're going into a trade show where you know, you're not going to be able to talk to everybody else, here's a good way to just scan everything. So I can see here are my two wireless, um, wireless DMX systems and you'll see they're sending short, intense bursts of signal. As opposed to, we have another guy hanging out over here. This, I think this is our, wi our um, it's either our, our mic or our wireless Wi-Fi Ethernet. Um, and you can see this is the spread method. So you see there's kind of a peak in the middle, but then it kind of spreads across. As opposed to our, our frequency hoppers that have these big sudden uh, peaks. So Ned, if you will help me, yeah. um, we're going to switch over to another wireless ID. So we can kind of see, can we switch over to, and the nice thing here is um, if you want me to switch first and we can watch. Yeah. So as soon as my, I change my wireless ID and I'm gonna change to five just for Changing fun. five, that is good planning and communication right there. So I'm gonna change to five first and you'll notice my, my lights went out. Um, and the reason for that is because I changed the ID and it doesn't match. But the second that I click over on my receiver, they're instantly gonna sync to each other again. Um, I did a performance um, a while ago. I was uh, working with a lighting crew up in Portland, Oregon um, for a festival. And we were doing a big show outside and we knew there was going to be a big crowd. And the thing about when you have a big crowd and you have temporary lighting trees set up is there's a risk if people are close enough to the trees that something can get knocked, something can get pulled out. And so we thought, you know what, let's put a couple, a little backup rig back behind where our normal lighting positions are for this event and we put uh, wireless receivers on both of those and set them to the same receiver ID. And when that one, because I knew it was gonna get knocked out, when that first one got knocked out, we put power to the other receiver, and the second it turned on, it immediately was in touch with the console, it was up to date, it was receiving DMX fine. So it's a really immediate response that you get from it. Um, so now we can see here over time, all of our activity has moved from the low end of the spectrum up to the high end. So we have, um, so we're on five, which is the high part of the spectrum. And then we still have our ID on six. So you can kind of see here how that changes pretty instantly. Can you maybe just run a few, just run the channels up and down on the sure. console real quick? Um, we have these set up around the room. Each of these uh, linears is attached to a, a wireless uh, relay. So you'll be able to see uh, you know, as Aaron goes around, the response time on this is just as if you would have it in wired. Now, obviously, this is a low interference area, and, uh, you know, this is about ideal, you know, but, again, this is where, where these systems are working, you know, just like you would expect from a wired system. So... I just did a little rainbow chase. Yeah. Any questions? My designer hat. Questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so earlier this weekend at a different time, we talked about RDMs, uh, but the two-way communication sometimes yes. being delayed. Is there more of that, less of that, the same amount when it's wireless as well? Or just because you mentioned it was an RDM. Yeah. You know, I would still, um, just like we recommend with traditional RDM, regular old RDM, name of our third album forthcoming this spring. <laughs> um, I would still turn RDM off after configuring. Okay. You know, RDM is a great tool. It's really good, but it can cause problems. And so, exactly. Thing. So, and, and if you're changing the channel or the profile of your fixture during your show, again, you have bigger problems. Like, don't do it, don't mess with it. You know, if you absolutely have to, of course. But, you know, we just recommend just leave it off. Save that for rehearsal time or prep time. So... Yeah. Other question? Yes. Well, one of the things I was going to point out about scanning, mm -hmm. uh, I don't have this. What, what program is uh, it? This is the Y Spy. Um, on your uh, jump drive, there's a little bit of information about it. Okay. Um, I, I have used a couple other scanning devices and, and programs, uh, one of which are available on Android but not on um, Apple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me why. Um, but the problem I had with the show, we, I was using a less expensive um, uh, wireless DMX, was 
was that I did my scanning at a time when the bulk of the staff, the house staff, was not in the building. And when I say the house staff, I'm talking about people taking a ticket because they, mm -hmm. they use the wireless scanners. And also, it turns out that the phones that they used were also all in the Wi-Fi range, the 2.4, mm -hmm. the, the, I mean, excuse me, yeah, the, yeah. the 2.4 mm -hmm. gigahertz range. Yep. So that meant that when I did my scanning, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I can look at, I can put, you know, it's going to be fine. I've got this big black open. And, yeah. and it, boom, it, and I didn't have time to reset. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, that's so, why one of the things I'm trying to point out about scanning is yeah. that you should also be doing it near showtime. Yes. So uh, the question just for the folks, the folks listening at home, including my dad, who I forgot to say hi to earlier, so hi dad, um, was uh, this gentleman was um, using a Wi-Fi scanner to set up his, um, his wireless network, and he did it during the day before you know the ticket staff, um, a bunch of folks with cell phones, that kind of thing, were in place. Uh, so he thought that he put it in a good place, and then when everybody came in, and so that that is why I, I say I, one more time: planning and communication. You know, ma ask if there are people using um, iPads to scan. You know, ask what the box office is doing. Put it in show like conditions as much as possible um, to really recreate that kind of thing and keep communicating, keep talking. Um, the other nice thing is that wireless ID six because that's going to operate away from those other things. But again, that's your big guns. That's kind of your last resort. So that's why we recommend to kind of save it for last, because then you would have a place to go, um, you know, rather than getting stuck. So yeah, that's a great, great comment. Thank you. Um, other questions, comments, concerns? Pizza recipes? Uh, Cookies? Yeah. Yes? Just clarifying the frequency hopping. Uh-huh. Uh, so this is regarding the adaptive hopping? Yes. Yes. So the adaptive hopping is always scanning no matter what. Okay. 100%. Every day, every minute, every hour. So again, great for the smaller venues, bigger venues, stadiums, that kind of thing. It just gets a little too noisy for it. So, yeah. Other questions? All right. Well, that's it for our presentation. Uh, we do have some more time. We're happy if you want to come up and kind of take a look at some of the, at the receivers or the transmitters. If you want to, you know, take a go at the console real quick and kind of see the response time, or if you have any other more specific questions for us, uh, we'll certainly be here. Any session musicians? Obviously, we have a lot of work to get done on our next yep. two albums, so. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so. Sure. But, uh, yeah, one what, last question. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, they will work immediately out of the box. There are other things in terms of how the relay functions. Um, if you want to turn the power up or down, that power, the broadcast strength that I was talking about, you can do that through the console um, or through your computer uh, with a special app. Um, but you're right, for the most part, honestly, guys, 90% of the times that you're going to use these, you're going to plug them in, they're going to turn on, they're going to be fine. We just like to give you all the tools, and let's face it, camp is a place to nerd out and learn about things. So we wanted to get like real deep in the weeds for it. Yeah. So using uh, one of the wireless uh, relays uh -huh. with one of the, um, the pass-through relays, I forgot the name. Yeah, the wired uh, ones? The yeah. wired ones, is yeah. that possible to extend for larger rigs? Absolutely, yes. yes. That's great. Yeah. Well, I have a further question is about um, using uh, the receivers on battery power because one of the ideas behind wireless DMX is controlling uh, units that are you know either rolling or being carried uh, and you can't have wires running across the stage including AC cable so yeah. what is <laughs> that would not, that's not really the use case that these were designed for. Mm -hmm. um, that, that would be more uh, the type of like wireless DMX uh, systems that would be strictly for control. This, this power is really, you know, for powering up full fixtures. Well, and so on. But the, but actually running the, the or, receivers. 
just using it as that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it, I mean, it plugs into a wall wart. So however, you know, if you have been in any of the power classes and making circuits and other things, if you can get enough juice to, to power it up, um, you know, you have enough juice for it to work as a wireless DMX receiver and sending DMX through. But um, we, we can maybe, if you have more specific applications, we can talk about it yeah. after. Yeah, and that is kind of the note that I'll leave you on, is like the industry is still learning this. We are still learning this. If you are worried, if you're nervous, if it's your first time, or if you're doing a very complex installation or you're doing something kind of funky, please talk to us. Please reach out to us at ETC. Um, we're always happy to talk you through things. Um, and if you have a big installation, especially one where you need specialized antennas, mm -hmm. you know, we want to know you. We want to know who you are, and we want to make sure that we're supporting you in the best way that we can. Um, so with that, thanks so much. Please mm -hmm. come up, and I call it the touch tank style. Um, so we have the transmitters and a board here, and again, receivers across the room. Um, you guys can play with them, ask more questions, and yeah, thank you. So...